I've been thinking about this idea of systemic racism a lot lately, and it's a very, very treacherous term, and, and purposefully so, I believe, or, or maybe it's evolved that way in some sense, because terms that are particularly treacherous are difficult to dispense with. It isn't the racism part of that that's the problem, although it's the, it's sort of, it's the heavyweight of the, of the two. You say racism and everyone responds, well, that's a terrible thing. And then to object to anything that has racism appended to it is a very treacherous enterprise because it looks like you're objecting to something that's obviously terrible. I mean, even if you're a filthy, greedy capitalist, you want to exploit everybody from each race to the maximum degree possible. And so even for you, racism is going to be a terrible thing. But then there's this systemic issue, you mm -hmm. see, and that's what, and that's sort of snuck in there, systemic. Well, systemic implies central tendency, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't use the word systemic. Mm -hmm. And so the proposition is essentially that the central tendency of the social institutions and institutions is racism rather than an aberration in their behavior or a deviation from the central tendency. And what we're trying to sort out right here is what the central tendency is. And so we're saying, well, people band together for productive purposes. They specialize because that is advantageous with regards to maximizing productivity and distribution because of the pricing issue. It's not a matter of exploitation. You have to specialize to do this, and there's a price to be paid for that, but the, but the price to be paid is offset by the price that you are paid for specializing. And so that's a completely different view. of, And so a system like that isn't going to be systemically prejudiced because it works at counter purposes to its central tendency. If productivity is the aim and the goal, then you want to exploit everyone equally. Mm -hmm. Right. So just on the narrow point that you made, I just want to amplify it that, yes, in a market economy, there is an inbuilt penalty for irrational prejudice. So, you know, you, you've got... Okay, so now we can define mm -hmm. irrational prejudice too. And this gets to the issue of merit. Right. So imagine you're making widgets. Well, then the hiring criteria is going to be facility in making widgets. And anything that isn't relevant to facility in making widgets is prejudicial. And if you allow those prejudices to influence your hiring decisions, you're going to be less competitive than someone who doesn't. And so the central tendency is against prejudice, not for it. It has to be. If, if you define prejudice as deviation from the proclivity to select for the desired output. Right. And so, for example, um, you know, the, the, the male-female alleged wage gap, and I'm, you know, I know <laughs> I, I saw your wonderful interview um, on that issue, but on its own terms, just think it's odd then if it really were true that in the United States, you know, men and women, you know, men or women are going to get paid, whatever the number is, 88 cents for a man for the same work. It's a mystery then. Well, so how come all the firms that are run by greedy capitalists aren't hiring just women? Because they right, can get the same they make output. A 20, they make a 12% profit instantly right. by doing so. Right. And so if they're greedy and exploitive, why aren't they jumping all over that? And the counter argument has to be, well, they're so prejudiced against right. women mm -hmm. that they'll allow that prejudice to override their greed. Right. And what's interesting, too, is it's not merely that, like, like so I don't have to insist that every single employer thinks like that. Just all it would take is 5 to 10%. Like, for example, why don't the female-owned businesses at least just hire all women to take advantage of the fact that women will do the same work? You know what I mean? So it's... The other the side that has to maintain that no, it's this blind, irrational, you know, sexism that overrides the greed has to well, apply. Well, and then they to, have to explain, well, why? What the hell's the motivation exactly? Is that so what is this? That there's a widely distributed cabal of owners mm -hmm. who are so prejudiced against women in the main that merely to sustain their prejudice against women, they're willing to take a 12% profit hit year after year. And none of them are deviating from that to gain a competitive advantage. Right. And that, that's the theory. Yeah, right. And why can't women who see this, it's so obvious then, why don't they start opening businesses to at least, you know, pay their female, uh, you know, sisters 95 cents 
to them. You know, what I mean? so it's yes, it's or eighty nine cents yeah. for that matter. Right. So it's weird that that system. So and and of course they would then respond and say, well, it's because of the you know, and they push the sexism back, like you say, into the the system. And I think you're right. It's an insidious term because they use racism or sexism as the the bad thing to taint it. But then it's, the, it's unbelievably insidious, right. and that that's partly why I wanted to have this discussion. It's like, yeah. is it systemic? That's the issue. Not is it racist? Mm. Yeah, yeah, there's racism. No kidding. There's all sorts of arbitrary stupidity. Mm -hmm. No one debates that. But systemic means central tendency. And so what we're trying to clear up here today, at least in part, is what are the what is the central tendencies of our psychological motivation as individuals and the central tendency with regards to how we organize our societies. And we need to make a counter argument to the proposition that it's blind, it's the blind application of power which I think is not only a weak argument, I think it's, it's, it flies in the face of the truth. It's, a, it's an anti-truth. Yeah. Because people don't organize their social institutions on the basis of exploitative power. It's not even very efficient to do that. Right. It's, because people aren't incentivized when they're tyrannized. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, so that's another area where I think what, you know, I've heard your lectures coincides very nicely with Mises' work. When, when you say... Yes, there are hierarchies, but they're not based merely on pure power. You know, there's, there's some merit involved, or sometimes there's merit. And that's what Mises says, that he, like, he would talk about, you know, they, they'd refer to like the cotton king or the, the barons of industry. And he said, in a market economy, the, the people who are at the top, the John D, like, why is John D. Rockefeller, you know, why was he on top? Because he delivered kerosene at much lower prices than his competitors did. That's and the how... same thing can be said for Walmart right. and for Bill Gates, for that right. matter, who made, who made, I remember what happened when Microsoft started to develop. Gates bundled software together and sold it for like one-tenth the price of his competitors. It was, mm -hmm. And he just wiped them out. And so, and it happened very, very rapidly. And so, okay, so here's another issue with ownership. I, Robert Breedlove brought this up today on Twitter. It's not his idea, but other people have made the same case, but he did it quite nicely. He said that private property should, the right to private property should also be considered the responsibility of private property and the responsibility properly had. It's like, okay, now you, here's a car and you own it. So what are you going to do with that car? Well, are you going to take care of it or are you going to wreck it? Well, what if a thousand of you own it? So do you take better care of a rental car or your own car? And so then the question is, well, if you own something, do you take better care of it than if you don't own it? And I think everybody can kind of answer that question for themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's in your best interest to take care of something that you own. And maybe you don't do a very good job of it, but all that implies is that you do even a worse job if you didn't own it. Right. And just to extend that against the Misesian framework, that's what he would say is, again, the, the critical function of having prices and the, just simple accounting. Like Mises quoted Goethe, who said um, one of the modern miracles or, or the best inventions of the human mind was double entry bookkeeping or something like I, I forget the exact quote. Yeah. But, yeah. That seems like an odd thing for, you know, a philosophical... Well, it's worth, it's worth, right. yes, it is an odd thing. It's, which, first of all, you should define double entry bookkeeping. So everyone knows what that is. Okay. So that, you know, on your, for, in terms of accounting, that there's like the liabilities and then on the opposite side of the balance sheet, you know, you have the, or sorry, you have the, the assets and then the liabilities and the, and the, um, the capital and the, and the company. So that every transaction, you, you sort of see the mirror image and you can just keep track of what's happening. And Mises' point was that sort of trivial thing that the socialists just say, oh, that's just an appendage of the market economy to put some numbers on it. And what, but he's like, no, that's critical because the, it allows the owner to know, have, are we, have we squandered our funds? Like our capital at the end of the period, is it higher or lower? And it's sort of like a scorecard. And so I'm just, that, what you just said reminded me yep. of that, like to say, Without prices, it's not merely that you wouldn't have the incentive. You wouldn't even know. Did I add to the stockpile of what I've been entrusted with to, to be a steward for, you know, in society of the, like these portions of resources, it's my, I own. And did that go up or down without market prices? You literally don't even know whether it went up or down. So it, it would be like if you had a car and not just knowing, do you take care of it or not, but not even be able to see it or not even to be able to open the hood and tell if there was an engine inside. Like you wouldn't know, am I driving it too hard if you couldn't 
check up on it in some way. And so that's what market prices do. If you've earned a profit, that's a, a signal or feedback from the entire society that in a sense, the consumers say, you've done a good job using scarce resources. That you've transformed right. resources so, into something okay, valuable. So, okay, so ownership buys us um, incentive. It buys us stewardship. It buys us measurement. And those aren't replaceable, especially measurement. That might be the most crucial of all of them because the others fall without measurement. You can't even keep track of what you're doing. That's the point you're just making right. now. Right. Yeah. That so we can have... Yeah, Mises so, has a phrase where he said the central planners without market prices would be groping in the dark. Well, that's that's the that's a that's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. I read in Solzhenitsyn, I believe, that the central planners under in the Stalin Soviet Union had to make something like fifty thousand pricing decisions a day. And well, you can't even make fifty thousand decisions a day. I mean, right. that's impossible. But and I don't know how they managed it. But without right, there's always an assumption. There's always an, an implicit assumption on the basis of people who are pushing central planning that the data will somehow be there. 